The Lord be with you. And also with you. Good morning. It's really lovely to have those of us here in church on such a beautiful day, but welcome to those who are watching on Catch Up later on. When we come before the God each of us knows, our God, the God of light, our strength, our song. So we say together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and perfectly magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This is the time in the service where we bring our own sins before God and ask for forgiveness for those things we've done which we shouldn't have. But today, I would invite you, with me, to not just remember those things we each have got wrong, but also for the times the church gets things wrong. This week, we've seen the evidence of when the church has got it so very wrong. And for those times we have failed in our safeguarding duties to all of you, and in the words of our archbishops, we are truly sorry for the shameful way the church has acted, and we state our commitment to listen, to learn, and to act in response to the report's findings. The report is a stark and shocking reminder of how so many times we have failed and continue to fail survivors. Apologies are vital, but they are not enough. We have to listen, we have to learn, and we have to act. So from a new clergy member, on behalf of the church I now represent, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for any time the church has caused you pain. I'm sorry for any time the church has been anything other than a safe place for you. And know that we at St. Mark's are here to listen if you want to speak. We are continually learning in how to keep each other safe, particularly in the current circumstances. And we will continue to act within our safeguarding guidance to protect everyone in our care. So in the light of God's commandments and God's love and mercy, let us confess our sins. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our name in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry 
and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, and forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. our prayer for today. God, our Judge and Saviour, teach us to be open to your truth and to trust in your love, that we may live each day with confidence in the salvation which is given through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guest, he noticed the man there who was not wearing a wedding robe, and he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. This is the Gospel of the Lord. May I speak in the name of the living God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. If asked, I think today's Gospel reading from Matthew would have to go in my top ten difficult parables. In fact, the top five. And on reflection, I would probably put Matthew down as my trickiest gospel writer. You might agree that today's gospel parable is quite a challenging read, with a fair amount of anger, violence and judgment included. Jane Williams, in a book of reflections, describes it as an en enigmatic little parable. I'd agree. It's challenging on at least two counts. Either because I don't think I understand what I'm hearing and I feel like I need to keep stopping to reread it. Or because if I do understand it, I don't like it. Just in case you're thinking, I think I've heard this story before, but I didn't remember all these details and nuances. Luke also retells a story of a wedding feast, but it's quite a different story. Check it out at home, Luke chapter 14. Anyway, I'm starting to go off track 
and perhaps just dodging the task in hand, which I think is to try, us, try to help us work out what this parable meant or might mean. What it means first to Jesus' first listeners, next to Matthew's readers some generations later, and then to us today in church or online. Let's have a try by first of all summing up the parable. The story, like so many of the parables, is a way of describing what the kingdom of heaven is like. Jesus tells us there's a king whose son is to be married. The wedding invitations have gone out to honoured guests. This is, after all, the wedding of the son of the king. Now the feast is ready and time to let the guests know. The king sends out his servants to tell them twice. But the invited guests are not interested, perhaps a little too busy, certainly dismissive, even completely again his king and his son. So much so that they will kill the servants who bring the reminder about the invitation. The king is livid. How dare they treat him and his son in this way? How dare they reject his invitation? And he treats them harshly in return. And at least some die. Following on, the servants that remain are sent to invite everyone else to this feast. Good and bad, Matthew makes a point of saying. People come. Phew. The wedding feast can begin. All is well. The king can relax a little and mingle with the guests. Only he finds a guest not suitably dressed, who, when questioned, gives no answer. Woe to him. So what are we to make of this? What might Jesus' listeners have first heard and connected with? In one sense, we'll never fully know. Jesus might have told this story more than once. After all, a good story is worth repeating. And the details might have changed depending on who he was telling the story to. And we know for certain that that happened with Matthew and Luke. But anyway, back to Jesus' listeners. A story about a king. God? A wedding? Oh, they'd heard stories before about weddings, especially in the context of waiting for their Messiah. Who's the son? Could it be Jesus, who they are listening to now? Hmm. Who are the servants that get killed delivering the message? Could it be the prophets? Who were the first guests? Them? The Jews? Jesus' own people and God's own people? Who were the remainder? Those in the highways and the byways, out on the street? The Gentiles? Surely not. Though that seems to be the way things are going with this Jesus. This is a story about God's mission, it would seem. But the man with the wrong clothes? Was that really the ending to this parable when Jesus first told the story? Or a separate parable in its own right? Luke didn't seem to think it belonged with the first part. Did Matthew add it? Perhaps he did. Let's leave it there for now. Now what might Matthew's reader or audiences have read, have heard and connected with a few generations later. For sure, a party to which the king invites his honoured guests and the tale of them rejecting his invitation and killing the messengers. That's basically the story of salvation. God promises to send his son, Messiah. He tells them to be ready and sends messengers and prophets. And subsequently, in those early days of the Christian church, missionaries who were all disregarded and all killed. How can God not be?
be angry. There's an urgency to this message. But this son has been sent not just for them, but for love of the world and all its peoples. Invite them, bring them in too. But what of that twist in the end of the story? The parable, all about God's mission, it felt complete without it perhaps. It hardly seems fair. This man dragged off the street to come. Where was he going to get a robe from? What's all that about? Perhaps it helps us to know that Matthew needed to tell these Christians, this church, that he was writing this down for, that the Christian life is about far more than just turning up. Some commentators even say this is a reference to baptism in which they're clothed in Christ. And living the Christian life, it demands a change. Being baptised into the family of God demands a change. The man in the wrong clothes, he didn't seem all that interested in talking to the king. He was happy to enjoy the party, its food and drink and dance. But the Christian life demands more than simply turning up. It needs them to speak up and in the language of the parables to be ready dressed too. Finally, what might the parable have to say to us today? We can sometimes dig too deep into the parables and try to find a connection between every little detail in the story and our lives now. And Jesus probably didn't intend that when he told stories. He told stories to draw people in, to surprise them, to make them go away thinking, oh, I thought I had God and God's way fully understood. And now it feels like I need to start all over again. Yes, he sought to challenge them and to challenge us, to help them and us respond to him and to glimpse what it's like to be part of God's kingdom on earth. It isn't a parable where we can sit comfortably, or at least I don't think so. Take the words of Jesus away with you today. Reread them. Sit with them. Reflect on them. Take them for a walk or into the garden. Pray with them. Ask that God will speak to you through them in the course of this week. Either that you might understand something more about him or about yourself. I'm going to do the same with this enigmatic little parable, one of my trickiest top five. I'll try to learn from it. Perhaps something about making sure I listen for God's invitation and that I respond. Perhaps something about the scope of God's mission or something about being properly dressed. But knowing that another parable is going to come along soon to get you and me thinking again. Amen. the light of
eyes to see your majestic love and authority. Words of power that can never fail, let their truth prevail. Speak, O oh Lord, and renew our minds. Help us grasp the heights of your plans for us. Truths unchanged from the dawn of time that will echo down through eternity. And by grace we'll stand on your promises, and by faith we'll walk as you walk with us. Speak, O oh Lord, till your church is built, and the earth is filled with your glory. Thank you, Angela, for that reflection on what is, I think we'd all agree, a very difficult passage, but thank you. And as those words stay with us for this day, this week, let us stand now, if we're able, and declare our faith in God. We believe in God the Father, in every family, in heaven. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us for the power from all God. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We pray for strength to follow Jesus. Saviour, we hear your call. Help us to follow. Jesus said, whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant. Saviour, we hear your call. Help us to follow. Jesus said, unless you change and become humble like little children, you can never enter the kingdom of heaven. Saviour, we hear your call. Jesus said, Happy are the humble, they will receive what God has promised. Saviour, we hear your call. Jesus said, Be merciful as your Father is merciful. Love your enemies and do good to them. Saviour, we hear your call. Help us to follow. Jesus said, Love one another as I love you. There is no greater love than this, to lay down your life for your friends. Saviour, we hear your call. Jesus said, Go to people everywhere and make them my disciples, and I will be with you always to the end of time. Saviour, we hear your call.
God of mercy, you know us and love us, and hear our prayer. Keep us in the eternal fellowship of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. So as we come to the peace, do feel free when we've said the peace to look around and give each other a smile and a wave from behind the mask. The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Look upon us in mercy and not in judgment. Draw us from hatred to love. Make the frailty of our praise a dwelling place for your glory. The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, you made the world and love your creation. You gave your Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Saviour. His dying and rising have set us free from sin and death. And so we gladly thank you, with saints and angels praising you, and say, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and joy, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. We praise and bless you, loving Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, and as we obey his command, send your Holy Spirit, that broken bread, and wine outpoured may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread, gave it to them, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. Again he praised you, gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. So, Father, we remember all that Jesus did. In him we plead with confidence, his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross, bringing before you the bread of life and cup of salvation. We proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ will die. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Lord of all life, Help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favour on your people. Gather us in your loving arms and bring us with all the saints to feast at your table in heaven. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory are yours, O loving Father, for ever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom. 
kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, say together the prayer after communion. We praise and thank you, O Christ, for this sacred feast, for here we receive you, here the memory of your passion is renewed, here our minds are filled with grace, and here a pledge of future glory is given, when we shall feast at the table where you reign with all your saints forever. Amen.
Let us gather in all those people known to us who have gone ahead to your heavenly banquet. Particularly today we remember Sheila Atkinson and her family who mourn. And the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be amongst you and all those whom you love, both living and departed, now and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord, 